Hello, everybody. I'm here with Hari Balakrishnan, who is an electrical engineer and computer scientist at MIT. Uh, more importantly, he probably knows more than anyone in this room how often you drive with your cell phone out uh, texting and calling. So he is co-founder and CTO of a company called Cambridge Mobile Telematics. Maybe you can start us off with just the history of the company and a Cliff Notes version of how you got it started. Sure. Um, well, thank you all for coming. Thanks, Carl. Um, so the mission, our mission at Cambridge Mobile Telematics, or CMT, is to make the world's roads safer. And uh, we do that by using mobile sensing technologies coming from mobile devices, uh, mainly your smartphones, using the sensors on phones to understand people's driving habits, automatically recording people's drives, um, and using modeling and scoring to measure driving. But we don't stop there. Uh, we spend a lot of our time focused on behavior uh, science, understanding people's driving behavior and creating incentives, rewards, gamification, and personalized information that makes people better drivers. Um, and then um, the third part of what we do is help insurers with uh, claims automation, using mobile sensing and telematics data to be able to, um, you know, if a crash did happen, really understand quickly what happened in a crash, whether it be a first notice of loss or whether it be crash reconstruction to help understand um, what happened to help with both customer service and claims adjustment. Uh, the company started, uh, I'm a professor at MIT, and uh, I started working on this with my co-founder and collaborator, another professor, um, in 2004. And you have to kind of think back to that time. It was before um, iPhones and before Android. And, uh, but, but we were working with embedded, small embedded devices that we built and also Nokia phones that had sensors on them. And uh, had this hypothesis that by using sensing capabilities on mobile, as mobile devices, consumer devices, we could actually measure things that were interesting for the safety and efficiency of our mobility systems. Now, we started the company uh, a few years after that um, on a uh, grant from the National Science Foundation in 2010 to take technology out of MIT that had had a lot of academic success. Um, and we didn't really have a business model. We had some technology. Uh, but fortunately, through that time, we, I'd been thinking hard about safe driving and understanding what businesses would benefit from safe driving, but also sort of understand what would make users want to participate, because user engagement is a key part of, I think, what would make technologies like this more successful. And in uh, 2012, we um, started working uh, late 2011 with State Farm. In 2012, we uh, helped them really get into mobile um, telematics and mobile usage-based insurance, um, and have continued a partnership with them since. Uh, right now, we work with over 35 customers uh, in 23 countries, uh, offering a platform we call DriveWell, on top of which you could do uh, a variety of um, applications to measure, to improve, and to assist in the claim solution. So early days, what were the challenges? What Was it harder for you to sell the promise of what you were doing, or was it harder to refine the tech? Right, that's a great question. So the history of telematics is something like this in sort of a 30-second version, at least my view of it. Um, it originated really, I think, in Europe um, and outside the U.S. with black boxes, you know, things that were originally invented for either stolen vehicle recovery or uh, then got adopted by insurance. Uh, and then in the U.S., it was uh, with OBD devices that you plug in as a device into the car systems. And those are a good... Um, in what they did, which was measure what the vehicle was doing, but there were two big problems. They were not very scalable because they were quite expensive. And second, uh, they really didn't engage users. There was nothing mobile-oriented engaging as far as the end user was concerned. So I'd say that in the early days, the most interesting question was, uh, so we, were, uh, we started going around talking to people about this in 2009, 2010, and the two biggest questions were, in t uh, number one, uh, this will never be accurate enough. You'll never get it to work. It's a consumer device. It's in the pocket. People are moving it around. How would you possibly know what the vehicle is doing? Uh, and the second question we got back then was, yeah, I think I see it, but can you implement it on BlackBerry? <laughs> so so it, you know, it wasn't the flip phones. That uh, was it was by then we would moved to Blackberries. I don't know how old Blackberries are. They're good for what they did, but that was the use case. And I, I'm, I kid you not, in 2011, we had... Uh, Somebody tell us, well, you know, we've done a survey of our insurance uh, book of business, and about less than 15% have iPhones. So uh, we really don't think this is ready. 
Now, I think the important lesson here is I think it's important to be patient. Um, on the one hand, five years looks like a really long time. On the other hand, it's a tiny amount of time. And um, uh, where we are today is in large part because we placed strategic bets on mobile when nobody thought it was a good idea. And then in 2014, we placed the strategic bet on um, investing more into IoT, a small device um, we call a tag, which actually helps augment um, the phone sensors. It's a little device like this that augments the phone sensors. You can attach it to the windshield. Uh, it just assists. It has its own sensors, and it's, it's a mounted device. Um, so I think it's important to sort of for us in our journey, um, placing some bets about the next few years and then trying to be a little bit ahead of other people. Um, in, it may fail, but at least you try. So full disclosure, I'm a State Farm customer. Got two of the tiles shipped to the house the other day. Very excited to try it. And my wife said, I'm not putting that in my car. I don't know what it's going to you know, tell our insurance company about me. Is adoption an issue? Is privacy an issue? Are those things you've had to overcome? Yeah, that's a great question. So we do consumer surveys uh, on our own. We commission it to a neutral party. Uh, we've done it a, few time, a couple times. The most recent one, the results just came out. So um, yes, it's a concern. Uh, and no, it's not a concern as much. So I'll explain what I mean. Um, right now in the US, in our survey, about 25% of people have been offered telematics-based insurance, which is actually not a bad number. It's growing. You know, A few years ago, it was a very small number. When we ask people what the principal factors are, we give them a set of choices and ask, what would you like your insurance to be based on? You give age, demographic, where you live, credit score, all this stuff. And then you say, a, you know, measurement of how you drive, 75% of people pick how you drive as the, what they consider the most fair factor to decide on the premium. Um, so that's the first thing, which is people actually, I think, want to be gauged on how they drive. Um, when offered a telematics program in our survey, uh, remember I said a small fraction of people are offered that, about a quarter. Uh, that's increasing, but it's a quarter today. Uh, more than half the people take it. it. The attach rate is very, very high among the people who are offered. That's 25% total or 25% of the underwriters you're working with? Uh, no, this is a survey done on consumers, okay. and you just ask uh, yep. you know, a, a bunch of people. You, you have professional survey people, and uh, one quarter of them said, yeah, I know, I've been offered that. Gotcha. Uh, that's what it is. Now, all this is sort of good, uh, but it's not free. It's like people have, uh, have concerns about it. Uh, the concerns about it are a little bit nuanced. The biggest concern in our survey that we found is people think the price is going to increase, that the rates are going to increase. It's very paradoxical. 81% of people believe, I should do a show of hands if I could actually see the room here. How many people believe they're well above average drivers? Show of hands. I'm going to say that's 81%. It seems a little bit less. But in the general public, on our survey, it's about 81%, well above average. This is, um, this is not actually possible. Uh, so a lot of people believe that. So they believe, but this is an important thing. I believe that here's what's happening. You know, the typical 81% of people believe they're well ab above average drivers. Now, of course, they're not all that way. About 33% of the people actually would constitute well above average. But most people just, they know that they are very good. It's just all the other people on the road um, that are not so good. And this thing about the price rate increases is that they believe, for whatever reason, they may have this perception that um, well, there's a small chance, maybe I'm not as good a driver as I think. The price is going to increase, so why should I participate in this? And Therefore, the lesson here, uh, both for us and for insurers, and one we've been really active with, is user engagement. It's being transparent. Don't hide the model. Tell them what the factors are. Explain why these are the factors. It's phone distraction. It's risky speeding. It's excessive braking, a pattern of bad braking. It's you know, swerving and you know, hard acceleration. It's based on the type of roads you drive on. Right? You know, driving at 50 in a 25-mile school zone is much greater risk than driving 75 in a 55 zone on average. Don't go drive at 75. But I'm, I'm just making a statement about statistical averages. So what I think what you've done that's really smart is you're not just thinking of the underwriters as, a, as your customer. You're thinking of the end user. Can you walk me through that strategy? Was it ever, was that something you had to have a conversation about? How, how many resources have you put into actually building an app and getting people to use it? Yeah. That's a great question. So first of all, we provide uh, a software development kit and a telematics processing platform. We would like to have a thousand flowers bloom enabling other people to build apps. So we have a reference app. 
Uh, we share it, it's a, it's a pretty cool app, but it's not marketed to the public. Uh, we work with insurance companies, with developers um, to build their own apps, and we see a lot of different ways in which people have built cool apps engaging uh, uh, consumers. So the reason why we've believed this right from the beginning is that we've always felt in our company that we want to build a product that we'd be very happy using ourselves and want to use as a consumer of insurance. And the best endorsement we got for this is a few years ago, one of our partners, one of our insurance customers said that with our help for the first time, they were able to build a digital insurance product that their customers said they want to use. Right? Insurance is something you generally kind of have because you, you have to have it, but this was something that they wanted to use. So I think user engagement is a very key part of it. We've invested a lot of resources. We have a customer success group. We work with a number of experts in behavioral science. Um, and of course, there's the technology side which we can handle about UX and things like that. But I think what we're doing goes well beyond that. It's understanding user behavior and understanding behavioral science and also helping um, you know, our insurance partners and the groups that they have, whether it be agents or whether it be claims adjusters or whether it be business people in, their, um, in, in the insurance company, uh, also want to participate because there's the, the shared value in making roads safer around the world, right? Society benefits, the drivers benefit, the pedestrians and bicyclists benefit, and the insurers benefit. So there's shared value here. And I think part of it is to explain to everybody in this ecosystem what the value is and that they can get, that they can get a piece of that. But you're also giving them tools to tell the story better. You're giving them context to their model, right? That's yeah. right. Yeah, you want to show people. I think transparency is a very big deal, in our opinion. Um, we just announced uh, a latest update. It was the press release hit today, which was State, State Farm's Drive Safe and Save 3.0 app. Uh, if you're a State Farm customer, you should check it out. It's, it's very cool. And this app has got a lot of great reviews. And one of the key things it does is focus on safety. That's a lesson uh, we got from our consumer surveys where repeatedly what we found is that what it takes, when, when you ask people what they need or what they would like to see in using a product, the first thing they say is they want financial rewards and discounts when you ask them that. Um, sometimes the expected discounts they want are excessive. They want a 20% discount to participate. Now some people are getting those discounts, but most people are not likely to because they don't drive safely enough. So now, how do you make them drive safer? That's where user engagement comes in so that they can get those. But the feature that they say they want the most are safety features. And they want to be, uh, they want transparency. They want to understand what happened on the trips. Why was I scored the way I was? And that's something that we've been encouraging all our customers to do in their apps. And so you and I have talked a lot about distracted driving. I've written a lot about it. Huge surge in traffic fatalities in the US. Do you get the sense that people sort of subconsciously no, they're not behaving as well as they should at the wheel, or maybe are, are not being as diligent about staying focused as they were a few years ago? Uh, you mean has it become worse or better? Yeah. I think it's become worse. I mean- The statistics would say- The statistics say worse. that it's become worse since about 2014. And I think it's provocative that uh, one of the things that we've done at our, uh, with our products are to use smartphones to actually reduce, try to reduce distracted driving, to use the same capabilities that those devices have. Uh, but I think as a society, what seems to have happened for us is that uh, it's become a part of our bodies. It's sort of become an extension to our bodies. I, I genuinely believe a lot of people don't realize that they're using their phone when they're using it. And uh, with the cars too, I mean, look, it'd be very difficult to drive these days without navigation. Like we've lost our nose for directions or our head for directions. We, we need the navigation. Yeah. And I, I do think there's, a, and we're in a sort of very notification based society. So I, I think, obviously, sometimes people know they're using the phone and they know they shouldn't be using it, but sometimes it's just a matter of habit. Yeah. Is it an antidote, though? What do you see in terms of results and behavior change? Right. So with the right incentives, and I should say, we work with insurance companies, we work with some rideshare companies, but we also work with government agencies. We're, in, uh, we're a smartphone partner for apps um, for Vision Zero, which is a DOT program. And we do city contests, uh, for example, working with governments. Right now we have big ones going on in Los Angeles, in Seattle, and in uh, Boston. And uh, so that allows us a way to experiment with a lot of different ways of doing, uh, doing engagement. And what we see is that with the right incentives, it could be uh, personalized information, where you get information like on your exercise, uh, um, um, the exercise uh, fitness things that you might carry, or 
social gamification in the form of leaderboards where you compare with other people, or it could be rewards where for younger drivers especially, uh, for them, discounts don't seem to be that attractive, but um, we've integrated with uh, gift card rewards. So if you drive well for a week or two, you get eligible, you accrue dollars, and you could just consummate that with, um, with like a gift card to a cafe or an e-tailer or That's uh, better than like that. a reduction in the premium. Yeah, because they're not paying the premium in most cases. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but the rewards really work. And the family sharing that we have allows parents and children to share in their driving and look at each other's driving habits and sort of then have a setup. So, I mean, I have a, um, one of my, uh, one, my oldest is now a driver. And uh, I can tell you right now, we have three drivers in our family, and I can tell you she is not the worst driver. She, um, she might be the best, but she's certainly not the worst. And I think a large part of that is because of the way we've set the rewards up. Uh, I, we think that with parents could use, you know, sometimes people give allowances to their kids if they have, if they accomplish certain things. And in our case, it's a certain amount of safe driving uh, gives, you a, uh, gives you an allowance and you could do whatever it is you want with it. You have 10 of those little tiles in her car. We just use the app. She, she, we, you know, the tile is an option, but uh, it's a pure app. Uh, Thing. And, and the nice thing about it is that now it becomes a social issue for them where she can compare the drives with, their, with her friends yeah. and they can then, each of them looks at it with their parents and I think it becomes something where they want to get better. Yeah. And she sometimes looks at my drives and says, you know, why were you distracted? Which is something that uh, has, there is a pressure. It kind of, you know, gets people to, to reduce driving. I read somewhere, and I think it's true, that one of the things that helped people uh, with, with get smoking down in the US was that they would educate teen kids, teenagers in schools about the dangers of smoking, and they would go and, you know, there'd be parents smoking Talk at home, parents, and yeah. the teenagers would sort of keep badgering the parents, and that helped cut it down. Right. Um, I actually think, yes, statistically, teen drivers, young drivers have a higher rate of crashes, but for things like this, they can get safer because they buy in a lot into the stuff and they might actually help older people get safer. Get I think it, yeah. we should flip it. Um, so lots of carrots, anyone doing the stick? And do you think that's something we'll see more of? Penalty pricing for? I think penalties in general have not worked in society for things like this when the scale of bad behavior or, or sub I shouldn't say bad, when the scale of suboptimal behavior is so high, um, I think that the amount of work you have to do to enforce um, is difficult. I do think laws against distracted driving or using phones while driving are generally a good thing. Uh, three years ago, uh, we did an analysis and we found that the laws were not having a big impact. The states which had laws against uh, distracted driving were not having a big impact. Uh, uh, we are going to do such a study again. We have millions of users now and a lot more data. Uh, I think we'll actually see a difference in it. And one of the things that has happened is a lot of the laws uh, four or five years ago, three years ago were don't text and drive. But a lot of people don't text and drive. They Instagram and drive or they Facebook and drive. And I think this is an important point. The it's messaging time. has to change. Yeah. Uh, uh, the other day we were, uh, we were driving and um, my, uh, with, a, uh, with a colleague and he, he took a picture of this, which is really funny. It says, don't, it's on the road. It says, don't text and drive. And then it says, for additional driving tips, text and it gives a five-digit number. <laughs> this is true, and this is something you see. I, I'll send the picture around and maybe Massachusetts? tweet it. Massachusetts? Uh, well, <laughs> I, 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 um, I don't think uh, a particular state is, the, is to blame matter. here. I think it's the general principle. Yeah. But I think the messaging has to change because if the law says don't text and drive and somebody's using their phone, I mean, how do you know what they were doing on their right. phone? Uh, but I think that the penalty approach ultimately I think ha will have some benefit. It's not, we've not seen the benefits. Yeah. But I think the engagement sees a benefit. We see an average reduction with simple incentives. We can reduce distracted phone distraction by 35% in 30 days. We can reduce risky speeding by 20% in 30 days. So I think that um, carrots and positive incentives do a really good job of changing behavior because they also allow that behavior change to persist. Yeah. So let's talk about the industry and the risk pool a little. Ostensibly, your clients have better models now, they have better risk measurement, and there's a self-selection factor where they're gonna get safer drivers, generally. Is it sort of table stakes to have telematics technology now if you're an underwriter, is it? Yes, yeah. absolutely table stakes now. I think that everybody should do this if they're not doing it, and I can tell you that in the market, everybody 
is thinking about it or doing it or you know th some of them are very advanced like s state farms of the world and you know progressive has had a obd device based program they also have a mobile program um, these are companies leading the way state farm has enormous amounts of data and it's international liberty mutual in the us has a ton of data and experience and internationally there are companies like discovery desjardins and a variety of others that have a lot of good data and models so it is table stakes but i think that the space of good models and the space of how you can engender uh, behavior change and improve people's driving is, is wide open. Uh, we're, we've scratched the surface and we're really just getting started. I think there's a lot we can do um, in terms of using the data, but combining it with incentives to make people better drivers, and then using the same data to make that claims process much quicker because we can really help semi-automate or even fully automate some aspects of the claims experience. So you can, if when a crash happens, you can populate the claims database with all of the context. So the customer service is quick, the claim cycle time reduces. So I think that it, it really is table stakes with respect to the pricing at this stage. And what does the competition look like for you? Is it, how many big players are there? And what's your competitive advantage? Is it the scale? Is it the size of your, the amount of data you have? I think there's, uh, I would say, three competitive advantages. I think that one of the keys is that we've been at this really a very, very long time, and some of these technology problems are very, very difficult to solve. So because we've been at it a long time, we, I think we have the largest corpus of data. We have millions of users. Uh, a couple of months ago, we shipped our 8 millionth tag device, um, and so that's a pretty large user base using mobile and tag. And then that's we have... That's the tile. That's the little, uh, this little device yeah. that augments your phone sensing capabilities. Um, and the second thing is that we have a lot of mobile only users as well. So that corpus of millions of users. Uh, so Ptolemus, which is an analyst, did a study last year. So this is outdated because we've grown since then and the market has grown as well. Uh, but last year, we, they, they, they rated us as having 63% of the mobile telematics market. Um, but that's one part, which is data. The second is that in the mobile only side, yes, there are other players, but I think we have a pretty significant competitive advantage because about half our users are mobile plus tag. So the tag is mounted to the vehicle. It has really good acceleration sensors, which captures the data and feeds it via the phone to our servers. And the phone's also capturing its own sensing data. The phone might be in your pocket. So now we have a, 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 a large number of users that are developing, giving us data from both the device that's like a black box, except much smaller, and your mobile, which means we can improve the models uh, in an online way on the mobile, so all those app-only users have much better, much more accurate data. Uh, and the third real advantage here is that we have worked viewing our customers really as partners um, and have been very collaborative with them. We have partnerships with them that involve data sharing, uh, including claims data, and we are very open with the data that we collect through our telematics platform and devices. So it's been very, very collaborative. And uh, in fact, we had not raised venture money until very recently. We'd run through partnerships um, and really customer revenue. Um, and you know, we were, when, you run, when you're fortunate enough to run a company like that for many years, you develop very close relationships because we've been able to work very closely with partners and have data sharing with them. So I believe those three are the competitive advantages that we have. We're short on time. Um, we're going to do the overrated, underrated game. OK. So autonomous driving technology, overrated, underrated? Is it going to make your company uh, obsolete? Oh, it's not going to make us obsolete. Because in a world with autonomous driving, all of insurance has to be based on telematics. It has to be based on observable ways in which you can evaluate the quality of sensing, the quality of the machine learning, which certainly isn't infallible. Sensors are completely erroneous, right? I mean, I was uh, in the restroom a few, uh, before this, and I had to move my hands in front of the tap about four times for it to figure out that the water should flow. Uh, so the idea that we'll get these sensors to be perfect in bad weather conditions and so forth is just, uh, you know, science fiction. Um, and, you know, and the quality of software. So it is really about telematics. Uh, I think that the way the world is going, like many other of these technologies, I would say that autonomous vehicles are overrated in the short term and extremely underrated in the long term. That is that what they will be able to do in 25 to 30 years is far beyond what people think today, and what they'll be able to do in the next three to five years is quite a bit over and above what people think today. Um, dashboard cameras, this is something we 
that yeah. would seem to complement what you're doing. Yeah, I think video analytics is our third bet. We placed a bet in 2010 that it's going to be based on mobile. In 2014, we did the IoT device, the first purpose-built one for insurance, and people told us that it's dumb for a 10-person, 12-person software company to build hardware, but they did. And last year, we placed a bet on video. We we're very bullish on it. Uh, it's going to happen, and it's going to become uh, uh, commoditized in many, many vehicles. Uh, it'll start first on the commercial side, um, and then it'll proliferate. So fleets. Uh, well, fleets, it could be ride-sharing, it could be vehicles that have it, like every cam cars today come with cameras, the new cars come with cameras, and video provides a lot of context that improves what you can do with respect to both safety in real time, which is what they use it for, but also assessment, uh, and it is very engaging for users to be able to show them scenarios and improve what they do. Yeah. And it's extremely useful as we head to the, on this road to autonomy, because it's one thing to do a few billion miles of your own. It's another thing to have hundreds of billions or trillions of miles with, with video data and scenarios and telematics associated with it to improve uh, the quality of vehicle it's vehicles themselves. Last question. Do you th are you at all surprised that it's taken this long um, for widespread adoption of either telematics or, or video monitoring or, or just general usage-based pricing? Uh, no, I think that insurance is a, is a classic industry, right? The classic is a word I was told to use for old. Uh, uh, but it's a classic very industry. And I now, uh, you know, I've spent about a decade working very closely with insurers and understanding actuaries and understanding science. I think that as a technologist, somebody who's worked in CS and computer science and AI for many years, I think that we, uh, it's fair to say that there's a lot of hubris around and arrogance that technologists have. But insurance companies have been around decades, hundreds of years. There's very few tech companies and AI companies that have been around that long. So I think there's, uh, one has to give a lot of credit to, it's like a big oil tanker, and you have to be patient, and when it moves, uh, there are two ways you can build momentum. High velocity and small mass, or a big mass and low velocity. And insurers are big mass and low velocity, but once it moves, the momentum really persists. Uh, so we should judge momentum, not velocity. All right, thank you. All right. Um, We'll bring on Bernard Goiter, Insurance Insider. Great, thank you.